Great. Welcome, everyone, to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today, we continue with PCA, and we will look at the kernelized version of PCA and what is this all about. Okay. Let's see whether I remember correctly. No, I did not remember correctly. So where does it go on? So here it starts. So we start with part two, kernel PCA. Um, that was like around 2000 and a little bit earlier. Everything was kernelized. Suddenly people were understanding. So we can kernelize linear methods. Some of the kernelization of the linear support vector machine was was maybe kind of well known in certain areas. So from Vladimir Vapnik's book, Nature of uh, statistical learning theory. So there are basically the theoretical foundations for these kind of methods. Um, but then in 1998, like Werner Trulkopf, Alexander Smola, and Klaus Robert Müller, they were in Berlin. And um, that was a research group of Klaus Robert Müller. And they were thinking, so PCA is a linear method, so why not kernelize PCA? It would be so nice to have a nonlinear version of PCA. That would be super useful. And they did. And they give it, gave it the, the paper, the title, Nonlinear Component Analysis as a Kernel Eigenvalue Problem. So it's not so easy to find. When you look for kernel PCA, you might not find it. Yeah, you will find it, I'm, I'm sure. But this is the original paper title. Um, some of the details are also in the book from Shulkov and Smola, Learning with Kernels. So that's a thick MIT press book, I think. Um, but first, let's understand. So what is nonlinear PCA, right? So what problem are we trying to solve? And I want to show it first on the blackboard, but then there are also some um, pictures in the slides. So let's again recall what was PCA. PCA was having a zeppelin or a cigar or some, some ellipsoid somehow in a high dimensional space. And you want to find out the orientation of this point cloud and then the, the, the PCA component for the largest eigenvalue will be the one for the largest variance. And that will point right into the direction when you, um, of the zeppelin or of the cigar. The second one will be orthogonal to it, OK, in a right angle. And it will point to the next second largest direction. OK, and if this is a cigar, there might be a third one. Um, now, what is nonlinear PCA? Um, yes, of course, let's. Take a banana, OK? So this is a banana. And then if we run linear PCA on this, what do we get? We get like one direction, which looks like this, right? So this is the direction of largest variance. And orthogonal to that one, we have the second direction, right? But does this describe the data very well? I don't think so. So somehow a banana is something one dimensional, like inherently. There are some ex space extensions. So it would be very nice to learn such a curved direction. So that would be super, OK? That would be really nice. Now, what would be the second direction? The second direction, uh, that depends on where you are, right? So maybe when you are here, maybe this is your second direction, OK? But when you are over, over there, then this might be your second direction, OK? So it's, it's, not, so every, it's not so well defined, everything here, what we really want, right? Also, what does it now mean? maximum variance, and these kind of things. So that's kind of unclear, right? I mean, yeah. So this also the other question is, how can we represent such a, such a bended arrow? Yeah, that's also unclear. So let's put in more axes. So that would be the second coordinate, right? So it's changing. Every, at every point, it's something else. Of course, we could also view this one as being something at every point, something else, right? So this is a little error, and here's a little error, and so on and so forth. So like intuitively, this nonlinear PCA is trying to find like locally nice coordinate systems. Yeah, we want to have a local nice coordinate system. Um, and then basically, we get such a, such a bended setup. And then, ideally, we could kind of unbend it back, right? So uh, having some mapping such that the data is again on a nice grid like that one. Yeah? So that's kind of nonlinear PCA. 
And of course, here we could also say, yeah, we should minimize the error. That would be good, right? But it's unclear, it's more unclear, what does it mean to project onto one of the directions? It's not so clear. Like, if this is one direction, it's like a line in space, okay, and projection would mean I would project it down. So that kind of makes sense. But then for the second direction, yeah, I, I don't know. It's not so, not completely clear what it really should mean. And that's typically also not the algorithm. So kernel methods, it's a promise. You take a linear method, you apply the kernel trick, and you get a nonlinear method, right? But by just using the same algorithm as before. However, in kernel PCA, it's unclear whether we really get this at the end. And at the end, we will see in kernel PCA, you don't get this solution that you actually want, OK? There are methods that can give you this solution as well. For example, you can try to learn a neural network, which is kind of trying to an autoencoder or something that is kind of um, encoding all the data into two numbers so that the error is minimal or something like that. However, the difficulty here might be the data is already two-dimensional, right? So the best encoding in two dimensions are the data points themselves, right? So why is this solution better than anything else. So it's, it's not so easy. So nonlinear PCA is somewhat less well-defined as PCA. It's less clear what we really want, OK? Um, here are the pictures that I've just drawn, OK? And I copied them from this website, NLPCA, nonlinear PCA. And this is from a um, student. I think he wrote his master thesis also in the lab of Klaus Robert Müller in Berlin. And, um, in his master thesis, he showed how to do this with neural networks, or with other words, how to show it with deep learning. So this was 1999 or 2000 or something. So um, neural networks were already useful at that point. And the way he did it was with doing uh, some um, bottleneck autoencoder, which is basically taking some higher dimensional data and trying to represent it in a with fewer coordinates and then again being able to reconstruct all the data points. And he had some clever insights and some clever ideas how to do it. And it was a master thesis, OK? So quite nice. Maybe he also wasn't the first one who invented this style of things. But like he had a very clever additional idea here, which I don't know whether it appeared before already. Here are more plots from his web page. So you could also view it in 3D. Like in linear PCA, you are looking for a coordinate system that is like on a right angle on each other. In nonlinear PCA, you are looking for these curved things. So now, how to represent this? The nice thing of linear PCA is you can represent this with three vectors, right? Or oh, let's, let's look at the board. So I can represent, basically, these, these directions with two vectors. And they are global, right? So they are filling the whole space. However, here, I'm looking for something local, right? So at every location, I need something. So here. I'm having a, a coordinate system uh, which looks like this, OK? But uh, over here, I'm having, or let's take that one. I'm having a, a different coordinate system, which looks completely different. So also, so how do I represent it, right? It's kind of unclear. Of course, the solution of Matthias Scholz was, OK, I, I learn a mapping. I learn a neural network which maps this to a lower dimensional space and then back basically to this one and then he's trying to minimize the error. And then there, there's an additional trick how to make it work nicely. Um, so the challenge is to find a curved coordinate system through the data. That is the challenge of nonlinear PCA. Yeah? And it could be done maybe yeah, by fitting, fitting something in that maximizes the variance. Yeah, so uh, in a way, if this is my new coordinate axis and I bend it open, then I maximize the variance along that axis, right? And if I would just take the straight line, the data here is more like squished together. So intuitively, it kind of makes sense. Um, however, the compromise between maximizing the variance is, of course, I could go through all the data points having some very complicated axis, right? Um, but this is maybe overly complicated and overly overfitted to the data. So it's a compromise between maximizing the variance and keeping the mapping simple. 
Yeah? So I want to do both. Right? Of course, another axis that I could draw in here would be like this, right? That would just go through all the data points. That's also a nonlinear axis, which is no locally linear, but everywhere the same. So that's a um, difficulty. There's a nice Wikipedia page, as always, on these topics, which are very useful, right? And sometimes I get, get great ideas from these pages. So, however, now the topic is, okay, this is the, the dream of nonlinear linear PCA. Why it would be such a nice thing to have, right? So it would be so nice to have this coordinate system. So let's kernelize PCA, and then at the end we look at what we are getting from kernel PCA. And it will be insightful, so we learn something about kernel methods. And we also have a new way to generate interesting features using kernel PCA, uh, PCA but it's not solving this problem, okay? So let's try to non-linearize, again, this word which I can't say, um, using the kernel trick. So here's linear PCA. That's the same as we had before. And in order to apply the kernel trick, we needed to replace the occurrences of the x yeah, with some kernel function, right? And the idea with the kernel function was, so if we only look at the data using inner products, then we can replace the inner products with the kernel function, yeah? So that is the kernel trick. Uh, so here's just a summary. I think you've, you've seen that one already. So the idea is to replace all dot products by a kernel function, yeah? And so this is a whole algorithm. You can now pre press stop on the video, but you can't now sitting here. So this is a, those are all locations where I'm accessing the x, okay? So this is from algorithm 12.3 that you've seen before. Those are all the locations where we look at data points x. So the first one is where we calculate the covariance matrix, and those are outer products. Hmm, outer products are not inner products, so that's something else. And then we are projecting the data onto our, our, our um, matrix of eigenvectors, and those are inner products, okay? Those are inner products because the x contains the data points as column vectors. Okay, so those are really inner products. So our problem here is our covariance matrix is not computing inner products, but outer products. So what can we do? So the challenge here is, can we formulate PCA, but only use inner products? Okay, and I show you how to do this. It's a little bit of linear algebra, okay? Um, but when you are convinced that you can compute it with inner products, then you have automatically kernel PCA, because then you just replace every instance of an inner product with the kernel function and you're done, okay? So the key to understand kernel PCA is to do a little bit of linear algebra. Um, let's do that. So here comes some background from linear algebra. I think I've showed you already part of it, but this is some additional stuff. So I got the inspiration for the following slides from this three blue, one brown website, right? This is very nice website, a very nice um, YouTube channel. So I learn a lot from it. So that is super useful. And um, so this feels now like a YouTube video, right? So people, you, you want to watch a YouTube video, and at the beginning comes advertisement for other stuff. However, this is my source, partially. OK, that's why I'm mentioning it. So here's the first thing about linear transformation. So a matrix A yeah, describes a linear transformation, right? How does it really work? And um, it works like this. So you view the columns of A as column vectors. Yeah? And then let's see what's happening if I apply my matrix A to the unit vector. And then the first column will tell me what's happening with the first unit vector. Okay? So this is like the coordinate axis, the x-axis, or the x1 axis. And here's the other axis, some other unit vector. And curiously, the second column is telling me what's happening with the second one. Um, by the way, why is this true, right? You just do row times column, row times column, and then having a one zero, you can put it on top of the columns, and it's like having a one in front of the first column and a zero in front of the second column, right? So that's, that's the reason. In general, we can also say any other vector, right, um, gets mapped to a linear combination of those two. So those two are a basis of the two-dimensional space, and here I'm telling you how to map the basis vectors with my linear transformation. Since I can write every vector as a linear combination of my basis vectors, right, by saying alpha times the first one plus beta times the second basis vector, I also know how to map another vector alpha beta, okay, which is just a linear combination of 
A1 and A2. And this is just writing out again the matrix vector multiplication. Okay, so this is how vectors are mapped. Yeah. Um, great. So here comes the first puzzle. So suppose we are given some matrix A. Okay. Now let's try to find two orthonormal vectors V1, V2. Yeah. Orthonormality said they also have length one. Yeah. And they are orthogonal around each other, so that means that the inner product with each other is zero. And we want to find two such vectors, v1, v2, such that their images under matrix A is orthogonal. Okay? So graphically, it means, um, let me try to draw something for you. Uh, okay, let's get rid of it. So, we have our vector 1, 0, and we have another vector 0, 1. Okay? So, those are the coordinates of these vectors. And now, um, basically, we have some mapping yeah, A being equal to A1, A2. And those are column vectors in this space. So, okay, so this could be A1, for example, and this could be A2. So this vector will be mapped on that one. Yeah? So this is equal to a times 1, 0. And that one is equal to a times 0, 1. Just what I said with words. However, this angle doesn't have to be a right angle anymore. Right? It could be anything. Um, this one is a right angle. The coordinate axis are a right angle. Now the puzzle is, can I find somewhere here two vectors of length 1, yeah, so they are all somewhere on the unit circle. So I can maybe z1 and maybe another one that are already on a right angle, right? So that might be v1 and that might be v2. And then after mapping with my matrix A, they are still in a right angle. Okay, so that is the goal. And okay, is it always possible to do that? Uh, the answer will be yes. It is always possible to find such vectors. And um, if we rewrite it now, first of all, um, let's write now the images of V1 and V2 yeah, as like scaled unit length vectors. So, uh, so basically it means so my image W1 is equal to the image of V1, but with the tau1 now, I'm scaling it to the right lengths. Right, so the W1 is the unit length vector. However, the result could be some arbitrarily long vector. So the tau1 is basically taking the length, and the W1 is taking the direction. It's another one on the unit circle. And the same for W2. Okay, then we could rewrite our product A times V1 and simultaneously A times V2, basically using now tau1, W1, and tau2, W2 as column vectors. So those, this is the image of the two vectors. And this could be, again, rewritten with some tricks, just as a matrix where we have the w1 and the w2, which are now unit length vectors times a diagonal matrix. And again, this is just matrix matrix multiplication, row times column, row times column. So this will scale the first vector with tau1 and the second vector with tau2. Yeah, multiplying from the right with the diagonal matrix is scaling the columns. Multiplying from the left will scale the rows. So this can be also written very short as a times v being equal to w times lambda. We've seen it last time already. Yeah? We talk about it now today, again. So let's reformulate it. Um, given a matrix A, can we find some unitary matrix V? Unitary means the column vectors are orthonormal. Yeah? And some other unitary matrix W, Again, unitary means the column vectors are orthonormal, so those are the w1, w2, and some diagonal matrix such that the A can be written as w times lambda times v transpose. So how did I get this equation? Just by multiplying the initial equation that we had here from the right with v transposed. Okay, and then v times v transpose is the identity matrix. Okay, so the question is, the puzzle is, can we find w and v and lambda such that the a can be decomposed like that. Now, suppose we have that, what does it mean? It means when you multiply 
with your matrix A, it's the same as first projecting onto the column vectors of V, then rescaling the length, and then projecting it back into a different matrix. Or with other words, here's the matrix A. Um, you first, you have a vector, you first rotate the space, that's the first V transpose, then you rescale the coordinate axis, and then you rotate some, to some other location back. Okay, so that is the way that we can write every matrix operation. And the answer to this puzzle, yes, there is a solution. It's called singular value decomposition. Okay? So that is like an, a more intuitive way of thinking about the singular value decomposition, that you first rotate the space, then you rescale it, and then you rotate it back. And everything that's written down here is just the usual stuff, the usual properties. And I know I'm sloppy with these properties, so if you find something that there's something missing, tell me. And then if it's super important, I will put it there. Um, okay, so far so good. Um, we can also look at it graphically with these nice boxes. So basically there are two cases, right? So I haven't said that the A must be a squared matrix. It could be also a rectangular matrix, okay? So that's why I'm stressing that the columns are also normal, but the rows might be not, okay? But the columns are. So and for rectangles, there are two options. Either I have more rows and columns or the other way around. Okay, and then let's write out the U, S, and V. In this case, now I'm using square matrices U and V. Okay, and the U is D by D, and the, uh, the V is an N by N matrix, so it's a smaller one. And for the other rectangle, it's the other way around. In between now, our diagonal matrix, it's also a rectangle, right? It has to be a rectangle, otherwise the dimensions wouldn't fit. Okay, interesting. How does the diagonal matrix look if it's a rectangle? Typically, there are even more zeros than in a normal diagonal matrix. So, in general, the S has some rows down here, which are all zero, okay? And possibly also some columns, which are zero. So, basically, here where I've drawn the line, those are the non-zero diagonal elements, okay? Or the non-zero singular values. That's also what they called. And I also could give the U some subnames. So there are some columns of U, yeah, which I call U1, and some remaining one, which I call U2. So which are the U2 ones? The U2 ones are the ones that get hit by the zeros in the bottom part. Yeah, so if I have row times column, everything that's in U2 gets hit by a big zero down here. Okay, so they are kind of irrelevant. So only what they need to require, but what is required is that all vectors in U2 are also, no, also normal to U1. So they must be in some different space. But then how that space is like particularly defined, that's irrelevant. So if there's one vector like this, can you see it on the video? No, okay. So for my dances, I show the camera. So there's one vector like this, and then there's some other space out here, orthogonal to this one vector here. And in, inside this space, it doesn't matter what orientation I have, because it's ir irrelevant anyway, OK? So that is U1 and U2. And the U1 and U2, one of them also has a nice name. The U1 is basically the range of x. So it's a column vector that spans the, um, the image points. I think it's called Bildraum in German. Is it right? So it's basically. The, the space, the subspace that I'm reaching after mapping with the A. So I take an arbitrary vector, I map it with the A, and then all my vectors are somehow spent by the columns of U1. Okay? Then you might know there's the null space as well. What is it in German? Nullraum? Maybe? Is there a nullraum? Yeah? Hmm? Der Kern. Ah, okay. The kernel in English. I don't know. Is it in English also the kernel? No. Null space? Okay. Uh, so in German it's der Kern einer linearen Abbildung, and in English I think it's a null space. Okay, so where is it in our matrices here? So it's V2. So those are the ones that are ignored. So if you multiply some coordinates here with, um, if you have a vector and you multiply it uh, with the, the V1 vectors, you project it onto the, the column vectors of V1, and to project it onto the column vectors of V2. However, then, by multiplying it with the diagonal matrix S, everything that's in V2 gets zeroed out. Those are the zeros that are out here. Of course, they don't have to be zeros, so it could be that the diagonal continues 
up to the edge, and then there is no null space, which kind of makes sense if n is smaller than d, right? So then it kind of makes sense that you could have a linear mapping that kind of rotates a lower dimensional space into a higher dimensional space or does some mapping with it. Okay, so that's like this down here is the null space and the u1 is the range of the matrix, okay? So the other way around, you get very similar images and the story is basically the same. However, now you are projecting from a higher dimensional space into a lower dimensional space and that means you will have some zeros for the v2, so there will be a null space. But they, the range might be everything, okay? Great, so far so good. Um, of course, this is a bit of waste, right? What about all these zeros and what about these spaces that we don't care for, right? So let's get rid of them, okay? And this is the so-called economy size version of the SVD, okay? Why is it relevant? Um, yes, suppose your, um, mate, you have a data matrix, yeah? Let's take the one down here and you have like one million data points and 10 dimensions, okay? Then what you get in the economy size one, you get the matrix V to have approximately the same size as your data matrix, but possibly with fewer rows, so some of the coordinates are gone. And then you have a D by K matrix, which is smaller than a D by D matrix, smaller than a 10 by 10 matrix. However, flipping back, in the full size, I would have a 1 million by 1 million matrix, which would be a, a complete waste, okay? In particular, we know if we are in 10 dimensional space, we know that the diagonal matrix can only be 10 by 10. So the overall rank of this matrix, by the way, is the number of non-zero elements of this diagonal matrix. Okay, so that is basically the relevant subspace that is necessary to store the information. Okay, so far so good. Of course, this was just a small reminder for you, right? You had it all present still from linear algebra. Um, if not, no problem. Now's the time to learn it because now you need it for PCA, okay? And um, could be fun to look back to your notes from linear algebra and see whether it makes sense now, okay? Um, let's look at some code. I want to show you some code how to compute it. So it's the same notebook as last time, but um, it's not properly polished what I want to show you. Uh, where is the stuff that I want to show you? Uh, okay, here it is. Okay, let's do some more coding here. So, of course, you first have to look at NP LinAlg SVD. So SVD is a subroutine of the subpackage LinAlg in NumPy. And there's one in PyTorch, there's one in all the other linear algebra libraries. So you can use it everywhere. So you can look at it, and basically what it takes, it takes a matrix A, and that's it. The rest is optional, okay? So let's do that. Let's just try it. Um, so here's a random matrix, and let's apply the A without anything else here. I'll tell you in a second what it means. So just run the SVD. I print out the shapes. Okay, it's always good to look on the shapes, uh, to look at the shapes, and then comes this special line. So this is the one that helps me to understand what do I get back. I need to now understand. I have on my slides a certain version, u times s times v transpose. The question is, do I need to transpose in the v? Do I need to transpose in the u? So that's unclear most of the time. It depends on the implementation. So you really have to try it. And only if you are using SVD every two weeks, you might not have to check it again. But when I use the SVD, I always do this check before. So whether I, because I want to map from my stuff that I've written down with pen and paper, I want to map it onto the code. Okay, first of all, we get, okay, the U is a three by three matrix, and this is a four by four matrix. And we had a rectangular three by three, four matrix. So this is good. And the uh, S is a three vector. Okay, that's slightly different. So we don't get a diagonal matrix, which would have been complete waste anyway, right? We are only interested in the diagonal. Okay, and then we get a value error, great. So that's awesome. So there's a size mismatch. So now what is the problem here? We have a three by three matrix times a three by three diagonal matrix times a four, di four by four matrix. So this can't work, right? So what, how could we repair it? Any ideas? Yes? A zero row of the diagonal 
Yeah, that would be an option. So to make it rectangular, right? So um, if you are, if you if you don't know what to do, right? Draw a picture and draw your matrices. Okay, so this is three by three. Then we have this three-dimensional vector, so it's a square of the same size, three by three, and then comes the four by four matrix. Of course, this is fine. This is a clash. Yes, those are the two possibilities. Okay, so let's start with the, la the first possibility. So the first thing is, okay, if this is 3, 4, then why not make this 4, right? So we can add a few more zeros here. Yeah? And that's an option. And you can do it with vstack. Is there, a, is there a function called vstack? I think there is. Yeah, vertical stack. Or oh, maybe you should use hstack. Okay. Yes? Ah, okay, so that would be useful. So you mean like a matrix uh, that say like a something like add zeros? I don't know. So this doesn't exist. That would I would call it, and then you give it a shape, maybe, right? Ah, okay. So that so that would be one that makes it such a shape that it's three by four. Another one would say then I want to have uh, I want to have one columns of zero, so it will be a three times one, right? So it's something like this, yeah? yeah. And then the right name. Yeah. Pet. 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 Uh, I could have known that one. So then I guess we can write it like this, a dot pet, maybe. Maybe like this, yeah? You will figure it out. However, it's not the best idea. The second idea is better. Because here we are blowing up stuff, and it's better to getting rid of stuff. So the alternative here is that we keep three matrix here. And um, to make this a three matrix by getting rid of the last one. Yeah? And this can be done by indexing, indexing. And that's what we are going to do now. OK, let's do that. So basically now I need to change this one, right? I need to add some, and I'm really, I'm not using it very often. So now let me check whether I'm doing the right thing here. Oh no, this is bad. Okay, of course I need to use square brackets. So every language has their own conventions. Okay, so that works, great. So let's take square records, square brackets here. I want to have not all of them, but all but the last one, right? So that would be something like this. So that should be fine, right? Alternatively, I could also say 0, 2, uh, 3, maybe. It's always plus or minus off. I'm not sure. So let's just check it. Print. Ah, bracket. OK, that worked already. Nice. Yeah. So I'm just taking the first three columns. Um, alternatively, is it like this also working? Yeah, that also works, right? So that would be another option. OK, so far so good. Um, let's look at the, um, the thing, this full matrices equals false. OK, so that is the thing now which is doing exactly what we want. We want to have an economy size matrix, one that is only keeping the relevant stuff. And this full matrices false or true is exactly what we need. And you can see it here from the documentation. Full matrices, Boolean, optional. If true, U and V have shapes, blah, 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 and N by N. And otherwise, they are rectangular. So that's exactly what we need. Um, so let's do that one. Full matrices, false. And then everything should be fine. And we see we get here a 3 by 4 matrix. And we just get the product U times S times V. OK. We can also do it the other way around. So let's do it with 5 and 4. And then the first one will be smaller, OK? Just as we want it. Uh, there's still some tricks to do, I think. We can also, I'm not sure whether this will work. But since this is a vector, maybe we can also multiply it like this. I don't know. There are some shortcuts. Uh, no, that was wrong, right? Maybe like this. Oh, this looks good. But wrong numbers. OK, almost. 
Um, I haven't tried that one before at home. I should have tried it. So there's also some things that you can do with, okay, that one worked. Okay, now I don't generate a diagonal matrix. Instead, I'm multiplying one of the matrices with a vector, but not using the matrix matrix style at sign, but by using the Hadamard sign. And I'm having a vector, so that is the wrong shape, so it gets broadcasted. So it gets copied as often as possible. Okay? So that's another way. But in my opinion, this is not very readable code. However, if the S is like a one million long vector, that's the only way to do it, right? First generating a diagonal matrix will blow up your memory, okay? So sometimes you need to do some computational tricks. So let's keep it in here so then I have a, have, I know it next time. Okay, so that was the other one, NP diag of this one, blah, blah, blah. So that's, yeah, so that's the old version. Okay, so that's how you can calculate it. Note that the V here, yeah, is different from the V that we had on our sheets of paper. So why is it different? So we, here we had a V transpose, okay? So let's double check that one. So here, let's take the other case. Let's take the case of three by four. So the V is now a diagonal, uh, the V is now a rectangular matrix. Now comes the question, which one is the unit, uh, the identity matrix, that one? Or is it the other way around? So who thinks it's the first one? We can do vote. If you don't know how to figure it out, let's figure it out together, okay? So I said here you don't transpose it, yeah? And on our sheets of papers, we transpose it. So for me, the V, without the transpose, has column vectors, and they have unit lengths. So that means if I don't transpose it, now the V should have rows, which are unit lengths. So and if I want to calculate the inner products of the rows, I have to calculate V times V transpose. So my vote goes here, OK? So that is my vote. I don't know. Anyone else? OK, maybe all of you now. Now you are convinced. And now the best thing would be if it's the other way around. Then we can spend 10 more minutes on this one. No, luckily I was right. OK, so this is the identity matrix, the other one not. OK? However, I'm going through this in so much detail, right? Because that's the kind of reasoning that you need when you implement the stuff yourself, right? You cannot just say, I do help SVD, great, I found the function, you plug it in and everything works. You really have to understand what do you get back? So are the, are the, did you get back row vectors or column vectors? And for the U, you get column vectors, and for the V, you get row vectors. OK. Uh, you only figure it out when you try it. OK. Question. Should it be documented in the Python documentation? It should be documented in the Python documentation. Let's check. OK. So it's the SVD, blah, blah, blah. Parameters. It returns the following. So maybe I, I make the font smaller. Does it change? Yeah. Can you read it still? OK, you have good eyes. Let's do, look at the first unitary matrix. The first dimensions have the same size as those. OK, that's just as the sounds, blah, blah, blah. The size of the last dimensions, blah, blah, blah. OK, now it only tells us something about the dimensions here, right? But curiously, this one is called VH, which sounds like V transposed. But actually, it's V Hermitian. And Hermitian is basically transposed and complex conjugated. So the H is something for complex matrices that you sometimes see. So um, this is just transposing the matrix, right? Flipping it. And oh, let's not use that one. Let's use BH is the same as B transpose if all entries are real valued. However, if they are complex valued, then basically it's B complex conjugated and then transposed. And that's, in a way, then, it is in the documentation because of the age here, OK? But that's really a subtle detail. So you better check by hand, yeah? OK, so far so good. 
I hope you enjoyed this small excursion in linear algebra. Let's come to puzzle number two. Let's make puzzle number two a little bit shorter. So now we're having a squared matrix, right? Squared matrix, oh, this will be about eigenvectors. And that's right. So this will be about eigenvectors. So again, we can have the puzzle find two orthonormal vectors, blah, blah, blah. But now, in such a way that the images are the scaled versions of themselves, so not new vectors, but the vectors themselves. And those are exactly the equations that you know from linear algebra for the eigenvector. Okay? And now we can again rewrite it in a nice way with the diagonal matrix. This is not just matrix language, which you just learned. And you can write it nicely as A times V times V times lambda. Okay? And if you rewrite it in one equation, like having the A isolated by multiplying from the right with the V, then you get like the equation that we had already last time, yeah? which is the eigenvector decomposition, which is on the next slide, and we've seen it already. I know there's some redundancy now in these lectures, right? I show it once, I show it a second time. It should just stress that the, these things are important. This is the important stuff from linear algebra. That's what I'm saying as a machine learning person. I'm saying everything that you need in machine learning is relevant, the rest you can forget, right? Who cares whether every vector realm has a, has a basis, right? For that one, I think you need Zorn's lemma or so. That's weird anyway. So the thing is, um, this is only the perspective of very practical perspective. So I show you the things that are useful right now in machine learning. However, maybe the additional stuff that I forgot already and never think about, but you learned in linear algebra, maybe you can create something new from it, right? Which no one has thought about before. So better check back your mass and uh, look at it and see whether there's something interesting which might be useful for you. Okay, so far so good. By the way, what's the big deal with eigenvector decomposition? There's a big book called Matrix Computations from Golub, which is a nice book on algorithms to calculate things with matrices, right? And did you imagine there's a big book and it's getting thicker every year? So, and there's a whole chapter on how to calculate the eigenvector decomposition. The reason being, that is a very interesting operation, right? It's something like calculating the square root. And you know the square root, there's a nice interesting algorithm. You can, you can have some iterations, how to get closer and closer to the square root of 2. I think that's programming 101. So eigenvalue decomposition is the same thing, but now with matrices in a way, because this is kind of like a square root. If the lambda contains positive numbers, right, then you can put half of the positive numbers, the square root of them, to the left side and the other half to the right side. And then you kind of calculated a matrix square root of A, right? If A fulfills the right properties. So, and it's not trivial to do that. So this is really a harder operation than just adding matrices or multiplying matrices. So to decomposing a matrix into these two parts, it's, it's a much more difficult problem. Okay, so far so good. So this is enough for that one. But now comes maybe something surprisingly new. Are the eigenvector decomposition and the singular value decomposition, are they related? Okay, do they have something to do with each other? And yes, the answer is yes. First of all, consider the, let's say, the economy-sized SVD of some rectangular data matrix. Okay, doesn't have to be a data matrix, but let's say it's a data matrix. It's a machine learning class anyway. So we have U times u times s times v transpose. And now let's calculate the covariance matrix, and so the outer product matrix, and let's calculate the inner product matrices, and let's see what's happening. So if I plug in the SVD for the x times x transpose, yeah, I'm getting a v transpose times v in the, in the middle, which vanishes because that's the identity matrix, and so I get an s squared. So what I'm getting from the SVD is basically the eigenvector decomposition okay, of the covariance matrix. And those eigenvectors are the left singular vectors of my SVD. Now what about the gram matrix or the inner product matrix? That's the other way around, and I get a U transpose U and then an S squared. So that is also identity matrix. And I get yet another eigenvector decomposition, this time of a slightly different matrix. Curiously, the singular values squared are the eigenvalues of the outer product matrix 
and of the inner product matrix, and they are exactly the same. This is somewhat good news, right? So where were we, by the way? We were in PCA, in a PCA lecture, and we were talking about outer product matrices, so covariance matrices, and we wanted to have, we wanted to replace that one with inner products. And now we found an interesting relation between the inner product matrix and the outer product matrix. So we are already one step closer to our PCA solution that is only using the inner products. So why are we one step closer? We see, okay, we need the eigenvector decomposition of that one. Here we see already the eigenvalues can be very conveniently calculated by doing an inner product matrix and then running EVD, okay? So that's super nice, okay? So that's already half of it. And the rest is just clever shifting around of terms, okay? So we found out um, the squared singular values of our data matrix could be used, for example, that's one option, or we calculate this inner product matrix using the kernel trick and having a nonlinear something, yeah, and then doing an eigenvalue decomposition to get the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. Okay, so far so good. Uh, let's see whether we can also get the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix from the information down here. Okay, that would be really nice. And it is possible. So the left singular values, which are the eigenvectors, right, of the covariance matrix, can be computed from the right singular values and vice versa. So you can go back and forth. So here are the formulas. The formulas, okay, that's surprising, right? But Okay, you multiply the matrix V, the eigenvectors of, or the eigen, the singular vectors from the X from the right hand side to the X, and then you scale with lambda to the minus one. Okay, great, or the other way around. And uh, let's prove that one. Okay, let's prove it on the board. Uh, let's see where is my. <coughs> I will flip to the board in a second. I just need to copy the formula u times x times v times lambda minus 1. And another formula that I want to have is um, the previous one here. I want to have maybe, or maybe, maybe that is OK if I'm, I'm taking the u as v trans. That should be enough information. That's not the right one. So here we go. OK. Now what I want to show is that this U is really the right one over here, the correct one, okay? And um, how do I do this? How do I do it? I look on my, I'm on my slides. Okay, it's just that one. Okay, fine. Um, first of all, let's check the sizes, okay? So this is an N by D matrix. The U is a D by D matrix, so it's a smaller one, D by D. And then I'm having a diagonal one, and then I'm, I'm having a larger one, which is then a D by N matrix, okay? So that would be the economy size style, yeah? So now, what about that one? So here I'm having my data matrix, D times N, and I multiply it with my matrix V, which is, in this case, a D by N matrix, so it will be an N by D matrix. Right, so having the right size. And then finally, I'm multiplying it by a diagonal matrix. So this is also a diagonal matrix, right? Is everyone clear what this matrix is? So it's just the matrix where I'm having all the diagonal entries, but taking the uh, square root uh, 1 divided by square root of lambda 1. 1 divided by square root of lambda n, yeah? So if my lambda is lambda 1, lambda n. So most strange operations, like minus a half for matrices, are unclear how to do it. However, for diagonal matrices, it's immediately defined. Yeah, similar uh, exponential of a matrix A. That's kind of unclear, and only physicists know how to do it. They need it. But um, for us, if it's a diagonal matrix, you just apply the operation to the diagonal and everything is fine, okay? Okay, so those are the matrices that we need. 
Great. Now I, I peeked on the slides for the reminder of the proof. And the reminder of the proof is just plug in something for the x. So let's do that. So we just plug in our SVD. So we have u times s times v transpose times v times lambda to the minus 1. OK, interesting. So first of all, this is lambda my, uh, a half, right? The s is exactly the square root of the lambdas, yeah? And then we see that this thing is identity matrix, and that this thing is also the identity matrix. So it will be a U. So far, so good. In all the discussions that I had on the slides, the V, we use V transpose V being equal to identity, and we used U transpose U being equal to identity. We never used it the other way around. We never use something like this. And also, that's not always the case when we have the, uh, the, the economy size versions. right? Then this just doesn't hold. And same for the u. So in these kind of derivations, it's always important that we have this one. And that one basically says that the columns of v are also normal. Okay? And that's the important property here. OK, so far, so good. So that was the formula up here. And we can also uh, have it for the submatrices. You can also have it for u1. And then you will have the v1, and there's all the, the, the lambda one. So one can also figure out that one can have these ones. And with submatrices here, I mean for any submatrices that contains the columns that correspond to the largest eigenvalues in lambda. So even if you only take u1, the first column of u that corresponds to the largest singular value, also then you have this equation. So you can take the direction little v1 and reshuffle it to get the u1. OK? So now what did we get? Let's check back. So we know already we want to do the eigenvector decomposition for the covariance matrix. However, we don't want to do it because we want to do it with inner products and not with outer products. So let's use the inner products and see what we get when we get the eigenvector decomposition. We get v and lambda. Great, the lambda can be used already, so that is already part of the solution. That's awesome. And the v needs to be transformed into the u. And then we are done. And that's, we've just shown that this is possible. So one can be transformed into the other. OK? By the way, why does it work so nicely? The reason being, um, in the SVD, when you recall this three blue, one brown, or whether it's the right colors, I forgot. So if you transform those vectors, which are a basis in the input space of my mapping, yeah, and you map it into another space, you get another basis. And that's basically what we're computing here. We're plugging in the V. We're transforming it with our matrix A, and we're getting another basis. Yeah? So the, they are just chosen in such a way that they are fitting here for this one. OK? So far, so good. Are any questions about it? I hope you start liking this kind of notation, right? It's super efficient when you write everything with matrices, and you talk about orthonormality by saying it's u transpose u being equal to identity. That's super powerful. Yeah? Uh, and also, these kind of derivations get really, really hairy if you want to do it by vectors, if you write them out with indices. OK, let's go on. So now comes the computational trick that I'm already talking about all the time. So let's say we have a very, very, very high dimensional data set yeah? with column vectors, maybe with 100 data points, but each of them is a billion dimensional. So the D is much larger than the N. So now, could we do the EVD of our covariance matrix, which is a billion by billion matrix? Of course we can't, right? So this, the cost will be O to the D cube. Yeah? Um, however, we can calculate the EVD of the inner product matrix, which is just a 100 by 100 matrix, if we have 100 data points. And that costs us only N cube in this case. OK, so this is a a big computational trick. OK, great. Um, so now, how can we get the eigenvector decomposition of the covariance matrix? So we calculate the inner product matrix instead, do the EVD of it, 
Okay? And then we transform our eigenvectors of x transpose x into the eigenvectors of x times x transpose. Right? And since the d is so small, we only need n of them, right? We don't need all d squared many entries. So we don't need a billion eigenvectors for a matrix which has rank 100, right? A matrix that has rank 100 only requires 100 of those high dimensional vectors. So basically, my eigenvectors of the covariance matrix that are relevant need as much space as my data matrix needs space, which is nice, right? So there's no. So we would be fine with a constant factor of 2 or something, blah, blah, blah. But we don't want to have d squared, and we don't want to have compute computations with d cubed, of course, right? OK, so doing this, and then we can transform them basically into eigenvectors of x times x transpose, and it's all spelled out here. And this now gives us an economy-sized EVD of our covariance matrix, okay, which is very nice. And we never, ever calculate the covariance matrix explicitly here. Yeah? We are just happy with u1 and lambda. Great. So let's get back to PCA. So here's PCA based on the Gram matrix. So the Gram matrix is the inner product matrix. Yeah? I'm not sure whether I properly defined it, but this is also called the Gram matrix. There's the covariance matrix, outer product matrix, and there's the Gram matrix, which is the inner product matrix. I forgot where the word Gram matrix comes from, whether it comes from functional analysis or from some other area. I'm not sure. Okay, maybe you can look it up. So we compute the EVD of the Gram matrix, and then we can calculate our eigenvectors using this super formula that we proven to be true. Okay, and finally we project our data. Right in PCA, we need to project the data onto the column space of the U. And now the, the magic happens. So if you plug in the u1 here, yeah, or the u, yeah, then suddenly the order is the other way around. So the x is now at the end, and it's transposed. And suddenly we also have here inner products, which is really nice. Yeah? So we also see that the projection actually can be done with inner products of the x. Yeah? It's not inner products with other vectors. It's really just inner products of the data point with themselves. OK? So few things to observe. We never, ever calculate the covariance matrix. We not even calculate the u, by the way. So also this, we are really cheap. So we really want to avoid calculating billions of data points. So we not even calculate the u instead. Yeah? We only calculate the, cover the inner product matrix. We're calculating v1, which comes from the EVD of the Gram matrix and lambda 1, and then we are done. When we want to project onto this space, yeah, we are just plugging the u into the formula, and we can use our x transpose x here. Yeah? So this is PCA based on the Gram matrix. And nice, the nice thing is, those are inner products. Here we can plug in the kernel matrix. Down here we can plug in the kernel matrix. And then we have kernel PCA. OK, so that's it. However, there's one thing, one little technical detail that I kind of put under the carpet. So what about the mean, right? We always say, oh, the mean is, is kind of, um, yeah, it's not necessary. We want to have this nice form. We want to write x times x transpose. We don't want to worry about this minus the mean or something. Then the formulas get too complicated, yeah? And that might be fine if we are doing PCA in input space, where we can first center the data. However, now, um, in the philosophy of kernelization, we are running PCA in this feature space, in this high dimensional space. And who knows where's the mean in feature space? We don't know it, right? So the thing is, maybe you map your data. Let me draw a picture for this one. Um, OK, you have here, you have your your banana data, OK? And you might have removed the mean. Great. So this is 0. Perfect. However, now comes my matrix phi, OK? And even though I never do this, right? I'm only looking at this by using a kernel. This is not a nice k. I'm only calculating inner products in the high dimensional space which I can do without mapping my data, 
Yeah? Still the question is, where's the mean, right? Because I'm saying I want to do PCA in feature space, so I need to have the eigenvector decomposition of the covariance matrix in feature space. And now I derived a clever way how to do this just with inner product. However, the mean is, we haven't dealt with the mean. So the next step will be to repair our methods to correct for the mean in feature space. Okay, how do we do this? With some other clever notation to calculate the mean and some nice little matrix tricks. Okay, so let me show you. So first of all, how to deal with the non-zero mean the matrix way. Okay, again, here comes some clever way to write the mean. So the mean could be written as x times the one vector. Okay, so this is the, the column vector that has n entries. So again, you can put it on top of the columns of x, and this is just summing up every element in the x if you multiply from the right-hand side with the one vector. Yeah, so the result will be a vector, and it's a summation of all data points. And then we divide by n, and that is the mean. However, I've written the matrix way. So where did the summation sign go? It went into the matrix vector multiplication. Okay? So, great. Let's remove the mean. So this happens by saying, I say x minus mu times 1n transpose. So now this needs another explanation. Or uh, maybe I do it on the board, so that may be better. So um, I'm, I wrote x minus the mean. Let's check the sizes of this one. So the sizes is, so this is the d by n matrix, okay, minus, and the mean, it's a one by, uh, it's a d by one uh, vector, or a d by one matrix. Okay, so there's a size mismatch. If you type it into NumPy, it won't yell at you because it will do broadcasting and just copy it, right? However, we have to be precise here. We are using pencil and paper, so we are better super sure that everything is fine. So how can we do this? We can do it by putting lots of copies of this thing in a matrix, right? So we're putting lots of mu's into this matrix. How many do we need? We need n of them, okay? So that we get a matrix that has the same shape as this one, and then everything is fine. Okay, how can we write it now in our nice notation? So it is just mu times the one vector transposed. So that's another trick. So this is replicating a vector as many times as I'm as entries in here. So let's write it maybe. So this is like saying um, I have this matrix, which is this box here, minus the vector for the mu times a one vector. Okay, let's write the dimension. So it's d times n. This is d times 1. This is 1 times n. And as you see, the inner dimension, of course, is correct. Other words, this is an outer product of two vectors. Okay? And if you do the row times column, row times column business here, you will copy the first entry along the first row up here. And this will copy the second entry along the second row, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is just a very clever way of writing that one, yeah, where the shapes are correct. Okay, so far so good. Everyone's happy with this notation here? Otherwise, speak up. Okay, so now you are happy with this one. So once you are happy with that one, we can start to plug in the definition of the mu in here. Then we have x minus 1 divided by n, x times, and then 1n times 1n. By the, n, by the way, what is this matrix? Does anyone know how to write it in Python? Okay, yeah? It just wants. And what shape? Nn. Nn, exactly. So this is just the one matrix. So if you have some, something where you, from, so now my mathematics told me there's a, 1n times 1n transpose in the mass on my sheet of papers. And it means in my implementation, I need to write ones, n comma n. Okay? It's just a column vector of ones times a row vector of ones. 
and that's just the ones matrix. Okay, great. So let's move the x out of this difference here. So we get x times identity matrix minus this 1 divided by n times the ones matrix. Okay? And by the way, where did we start? Oh, yeah, we wanted to remove the mean. So we wanted to remove the mean from our data, but now the matrix way. So this is just right multiplicating a special matrix H from the right hand side. And this will remove the mean of the x. Okay? And this gets a name. For a long time, I thought it has a special name, and I say it in all my old lectures, but then I found out this matrix that I'm talking about is something completely different. So from now on, it's just the so called centering matrix. Okay? So this is the centering matrix. This matrix I minus and then ones, where the ones are replaced by a 1 divided by n. Okay? It has some nice properties. It's a square matrix. It's a symmetric matrix, right? Why is it symmetric? Because this is the ones matrix, a scaled ones matrix, a negative ones matrix, and the ones matrix is symmetric, and the identity two matrix is also symmetric, and the sum of two symmetric matrices is also symmetric. Okay, so that's why it's symmetric. And it's idempotent. Yeah, idempotent means you can apply it once, something happens, and you apply it twice, and then nothing more happens. Does it make sense for removing the mean? Yes, absolutely, right? So you remove the mean once, and then it's gone, right? When you remove it again, nothing should change. And you can, you can check it that this thing is an idempotent matrix. Um, I'm not sure, is it the homework? So I, I just show you, I mean, how to do it. I, I don't show you completely, but I show you how to approach it to show the idempotence of this. So you say HH. H, then you plug everything in. So then you have this ones matrix, and I use a different notation now. Let's take that one. It's also ones matrix, a new shape, times identity matrix times 1 divided by n. And then you compute it. And at the end, after a couple of steps, you will get the h. OK? It's really not difficult. I hope I also, along the way, convince you that mathematics is super useful to writing code, right? Because um, so this is giving, giving me a new version of, of removing the mean also in my code, right? I can just have this matrix H, and maybe I'm implementing it as a sparse matrix. And then I extended my programming language, and I can just say data matrix times H, and that's it. And then if the H is a sparsely defined matrix, the matrix matrix multiplication will be fast, as fast as removing the mean the other way around. OK? As I said, this notation on the board is just another programming language yeah, that can be translated into code as well. OK, what else? So we multiply from the right, and that removes the mean. So that's it. OK, how can we do it now for the gram matrix? Let's calculate the gram matrix for the non-zero mean. OK? So in principle, we know if we have a data set, we could either calculate the gram matrix and calculate the EVD, or we calculate the covariance matrix. So let's calculate the gram matrix of the data where we remove the mean. Let's plug it into the formula. And as you can see, curiously, we can calculate the inner products first without removing the mean. And then we multiply from the left and from the right this centering matrix, and that's it. So now, how can we remove the mean in feature space? You just multiply from the left and from the right our nice centering matrix. OK? And that's doing exactly the right thing. So the good thing is we can just calculate our kernel matrix using our kernel function without ever going into the feature space. And then we're multiplying from the left and from the right this H matrix. And of course, multiplying from the right and from the left the H matrix might not be the best implementation for that one, right? We know it's about removing the mean. So once we have to remove the column mean, and I think once we have to remove the row mean. Yeah? I think that's right. Hmm. No, yes, I think so. It's like saying K times H. Right? Let's say K is now my data matrix with columns and some information in there. And then I'm removing basically the column mean from all the points. 
And then after that, I'm removing the row mean. Okay? So that should be then the implementation. So you, if you have a million data points, okay, you will have a million by million kernel matrix anyway, but you want to avoid multiplying two million squared matrices with each other. It could be avoided by then implementing k times h by just classically removing the mean, as you would do, computationally efficient. And then the other way around could be implemented by just applying it to the transposed result. Yeah? Okay, great. So far, so good. So here's kernel PCA. So we are given some data set, and we're calculating the kernel matrix. The kernel matrix contains all inner products between data points xi, xj. However, not the inner product in input space, but the inner product in some super high dimensional feature space, possibly infinitely high dimensional feature space. And that's no lie. For the Gaussian kernel, it's in principle infinitely dimensional. So it's really a non parametric thing. Um, then we calculate the eigenvector decomposition of the centered gram matrix. So we have to have this additional step of multiplying from the left and from the right the matrix H. Okay? And from that matrix, we are calculating our eigenvector decomposition. Great. Finally, we project the centered data yeah, onto the resulting eigenvalues. So we also, um, again, use the centered covariance matrix here and project it onto V1 and rescale it with lambda 1, for example, where the last step here is optional. But typically, one is also rescaling it. OK. If you have new data points, that are not in your training data set to compute the v and lambda. Of course, for the training data points, you would have to calculate the covariance matrix, uh, no, not the kernel matrix, where you apply from the left-hand side your training data set and from the right-hand side your new test points. OK? And then you plug it into these formulas. Maybe a little picture for that one, because that might be some information that you might be missing. So. Let's say you have a training, training data x1 to xn, OK, and you can calculate a kernel matrix for that one, right? So that is the kernel matrix here for 1 to n, for 1 to n. Uh, now let's say we get some test points, and let's call them xn plus 1 until xm. Yeah? Then you could also think of a larger matrix that contains all the entries, right? So there is the kernel matrix down here. Let's abbreviate it as, ah, now let's not abbreviate it. Let's put 1 to n, OK? So that should be fine. And that is n plus 1 to m. So this is the, the bottom part. Only the test points compared with itself. However, if we have test points, and we want to use now the information from the training set, of course, we need to compare our test points with the training points. So here's another matrix, which will be 1 to n, and then n plus 1 to m. OK, let's put it here also. So that might be more logical. OK, my notation is kind of cumbersome. Yeah, so you know what I mean, OK? And so this thing is basically the same thing transposed. Yeah. So there is a larger matrix that contains all the data. Yeah? And in a way, during training, I'm looking at this one. And then when I have my test points, I have to use this matrix here, the rectangular part. Because that one is comparing the test data points and calculating inner products with these. OK. Let's look back at the formula. So here, down here, this matrix would be this rectangular one that I just shown you on the board, where I'm um, basically comparing my test points with the training points. And then this gives me similarities. And those similarities are used to generate linear combinations of the columns of V. And that will be the answer at the end. OK? So far, so good? OK. If we apply to some toy data, we get some weird results, which is written up here. But I show you code that computes the same stuff. So let's look at the code. 
Again, I think there will be a homework where you have to implement KPCA. That's why I'm generously Im including it here from the ML solution code. So the code is not in here, the KPCA code. But it's just an implementation of linear algebra formulas, which is a good exercise anyway. So let's jump to the kernel PCA. So this is kernel PCA. So here's, I define a couple of kernel functions as before, as for the support vector machine. I think it's copy and paste from the support vector machine lecture. I have some plotting function where I want to have something nice looking. Okay, here comes the arc data. So this is the arc data set, which is uniformly distributed, and then I'm squaring one of the components and getting the other component, adding some noise to it. So that's how I get a banana, okay? So this is my banana. And then I, I need to define now a kernel function here. So why, oh, I want to have a fixed parameter. So I'm, this is currying, right? So you know currying, by the way? Do you know if you have a function with two inputs and you want to have a function with one input? This is called currying. You don't know it? So this is functional programming, okay? Some of you know, okay. So I'm currying here this Gaussian kernel function. So the Gaussian kernel function has three inputs, where the third one is a parameter, but I want to have it fixed. And my PCA implementation, kernel PCA implementation, takes a function of two inputs with fixed parameters. That's why I'm currying them away with this lambda construction, okay? So far, so good. I plug it everything in, and then I plot the solution. Now the question is, how do we plot the solution? Where are the nice arrows, right? And here I'm plotting it in a different way. So I'm saying the first plot is showing us the first principal component in feature space. And what I'm plotting here is I'm using the locations from the input space, so the banana shape, but I'm coloring it with the coefficient along the first nonlinear direction. Okay, and here you see that it's nicely increasing from small numbers, let's say this is zero, to larger numbers. So it's found the first direction very nicely in feature space. However, the second direction is not what we wanted. The second direction that we wanted would have been inside yellow and would have changed the color going to the outside, right? So that would have been a good description of the second component. Unfortunately, we kind of get something like the first component squared. If this is minus 1, 0, plus 1, then this will be plus 1, 0, minus 1, kind of. Yeah? The colors don't match exactly as I said. What about the second one? It's, it's even more weird, right? It's, another it's going from small to large to small to large. And what about this one? It's going from, from large to small to large to small to large. Does it remind you of anything? This is like a Fourier transform. Yet another cool connection. But this is like saying, so this is the, the, the lowest frequency, like going up and down once. And this is going twice. Sine, this might be like a cosine. This is, again, like a sine with a double frequency. And this is like a cosine with a double frequency. And actually, when you look at the kernel of the Gaussian kernel and you look at the Fourier transform of that one or as the eigenvector decomposition, I think, of typical kernel matrices, that corresponds to the Fourier transform in a way. So for details on that one, uh, there's a nice book on Gaussian processes, which, which I will mention later. So if you are into these math things and want to understand what is the exact connection with the Fourier transform, so there is some interesting connection. However, so now, why is that the nonlinear PCA solution. That's super useless in a way, right? So that is not really what we wanted. So the thing is, we wanted orthogonality, or we wanted to have orthonormal solutions in input space, right? So we had, here we had right angles everywhere. And in our banana picture, we wanted to have little coordinate systems which are like orthogonal in input space. However, we did PCA in feature space. So that means we found solutions that are orthogonal in feature space. And orthogonality in feature space means that the kernel of something is equal to 0. OK? So, however, the orthogonality in feature space yeah, looks like the Fourier components in input space. OK? 
This is somewhat mind-blowing or somewhat wow, but um, is it then all useful, uh, useless? No, it's not. The data is nicely described. This is like an encoding. I don't know, you don't know transformers yet, but there is in deep learning, there are transformers, some super fancy method, and they use so-called positional encodings using some nice sinusoidal thing. So here we kind of, we encoded every position along this one, where this is basically giving us maybe the first bit, so either a 0 or a 1, and this is giving us a second bit, a 1, then a 0, and then a 1, and this is giving us a third bit and a fourth bit. So in a way, we are really encoding all the information along the manifold in some features that can be used. And one can show, let's say you have a linear SVM or a nonlinear SVM with some kernel function, instead of running a nonlinear SVM on a complicated data set, you run first kernel PCA, and then you take the important kernel PCA features, the components that you get, and then you run a linear support vector machine, and you get quite similar results. Okay, so they are somewhat useful. Let's look at another example, clusters. Also here, it's a bit disappointing. I mean, but what do we expect by clusters anyway, right? Why run PCA on clusters? So that's like a weird idea anyway. But we can do it. So this is my data set for clusters. And also here, the PCA component, the kernel PCA components nicely kind of encode the clusters, right? So this one gets a, let's say, a, a plus one. This one gets a zero, and this one gets a minus one. And here it's orthogonal to it, the other way around. And then we have other combinations. And also now inside a cluster, we can describe where the data points are. So in a way, we are encoding where the points are relative to each other. OK? So actually, this kernel PCA can be used to cluster data. Now we could use these new features yeah, to do a clustering of data sets. And this is called kernel clustering, so it exists. Yeah? Um, final example, that's my favorite one. I call it the sheet of paper example. So I'm having a sheet of paper, like a A4 paper, OK? And when I run PCA on it, I should first get one direction and then the other direction. And I can twist my paper. Where's my paper here? No paper around. Here's one. So why is a paper something super useful to try PCA? Because we know exactly the solution, right? One solution is that one, and the other one is that one. So I generate data points on a 2D space, maybe uniformly distributed, where this edge is a little bit longer. yeah. And then I can rotate it into a high dimensional space. And then if my PCA method works, it should figure out these two axes. So it's a very good toy data set. So if PCA is any good, it should also find these directions, right? And so we can try it in, in high dimensional space. And that is what this PCA, uh, kernel PCA applied to the sheet of paper experiment is. So I'm having here my uniform distribution. I scale one of the axes by two. And then I run kernel PCA with a Gaussian kernel. So I'm not running linear PCA. I could use a linear kernel, right? And if I use a linear kernel, I think everything should be fine. Or do I get an error message? Now, with a linear kernel, I get nicely the first and the second direction. Perfect. And some other weird stuff. But those things, they basically are eigenvalues of size 0, right? Because my data is two-dimensional anyway. Let's take the linear kernel here. Oh, this is the comment, and run it. And in that case, I'm getting also nice the first direction. I'm getting the second direction. And then start this sinusoidal stuff, right? I get here some cosine style representation for the longer axis. And here I'm getting a combination of both. And here I'm getting yet another combination. And you see, those are like the harmonics. Do you know harmonics on the surface of a sphere? This is similar to these harmonics. Yeah? It's like Fourier transforms on some curved surfaces. The interesting thing is now what's happening. So this is nice. So the first two are good. But let's make the sheet of paper longer. OK, let's make it a little bit longer. And let's see what now the direction of the second largest direction is. And then suddenly, the direction that I was after, like the one that is orthogonal to the first direction, is now only the third principal component. 
because in feature space, there's another component, the one, a second one on the first axis, but kind of squared, which has a larger variance. Okay? And by increasing this number here, I don't know, let's take five, like the one that I'm actually after is moving further and further away. So now something that is about the, oh, the vertical one is now the fourth dimension here. Okay? So is it all useless? No, it's not. But it's not nonlinear PCA. Okay? It's a kernelized version of PCA, and it gives us interesting features. And they are so interesting, you can even do clustering with them, and you can do classification with them, and many things. However, they are not following our intuition. And the bug is, we get features that are orthogonal in feature space, but the features are not orthogonal in input space. So that is a problem. But it's not a problem. It's just a feature extraction method. So far, so good? OK, so let's wrap up. So, um, oh no, we don't wrap up. So there's a third possibility to do PCA that I wanted to add. So we've seen two now. We've seen that we can calculate the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. We can calculate the eigenvectors of the Gram matrix. Yeah? And this trick allows us to do kernel PCA, because then we only do inner products. However, there's a third one. And the third one is we neither compute the covariance matrix, neither the, cover the Gram matrix. We just directly do the SVD of the data matrix. Okay, And we know the left singular vectors are the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. So we are immediately done. Okay, So why not always do approach number three? So suppose your data set is 10 dimensional and you have 1 million data points, then running the SVD on a 10 by 1 million matrix is much more expensive than first calculating the 10 by 10 covariance matrix and then running the EVD on that one. Okay? You know, the EVD, the eigenvector decomposition, is something cube in the runtime. So it's cube in the size of the matrix. So if the SVD is, I think, more expensive on the full data matrix than to run the EVD on the covariance matrix in case the dimensionality is small. Okay? So for that reason, we don't do that. And of course, this one also doesn't work for the kernel trick. right? So that wouldn't work for the kernel trick. Anyway, sometimes you have small data sets, then maybe the SVD implementation of PCA might be just fine, right? So it's, it's getting rid of one of the steps. OK, here's the summary. So dimensionality reduction. We are given some data points in some higher dimensional space. We want to have some lower dimensional embedding, some lower dimensional representation, yeah? where we kind of keep the properties. Properties, it's in, it's in uh, quotation marks. It's unclear what we exactly mean by that. And depending on what we mean by that, we end up with different algorithms. If we keep the variance, yeah, or we minimize the mean squared error, we, in input space, we have PCA. If we want to keep the variance or minimize the mean squared error in feature space, we have kernel PCA. However, what that exactly means, keeping the variance, is not so clear, right? Because we have these kind of complicated manifolds. There are three possible solutions for PCA, either the covariance matrix or the Gram matrix or directly the SVD. And that's it for today. Thanks for your attention. I hope you learned something, and I see you on Wednesday.